Hello and welcome to On the Same Page, a new series of intergenerational conversations by Changing the Narrative in Colorado, a partnership of Next 50 Initiative and the Rose Community Foundation. I'm your host, Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for joining us. I am joined today by a very diverse group of people to discuss what the future of work might look like in the post-COVID economy in Colorado. Allow me to introduce our very esteemed panel. Joe Barella, Executive Director of the Colorado Department of Labor and Employment. Karen Brown, Director of Changing the Narrative's Age-Friendly Workplace Initiative. Missy Darnell, Recent Graduate and Doctor in Physical Therapy. Chris Gierken, Recent Graduate and Master in Health Administration, as well as the Campaign Manager for On the Same Page. Andrew Hudson, Creator of Andrew Hudson's Job List. Catherine Keegan, Director of the Office of the Future of Work. Trey Miller, Executive Director of the Logan County Economic Development Corporation. Navneet Saini, a recent graduate and master in health administration. Tony Tapia, co-chair of the Strategic Action Planning Group on the Aging Workforce Development Committee. And Renice Walker, senior consultant with the Colorado Workforce Development Council. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us, and I am looking very forward to, I think, what promises to be a very lively conversation. Uh, Joe, I want to start with you with our first question. Uh, in January, you looked at Colorado, and there is a lot of promising job growth, a lot of great strong indicators. Now we're in an entirely different world. Can you set the stage for us? Can you let us know what's going on in Colorado, and what can we expect over the next year? Great question, Dominic, and I think many of us know that in February of this year, Colorado was in a boom, and our unemployment rate was around 2.5% for the entire state. And almost overnight, uh, we saw that change because of the pandemic. And so the month of March and the month of April, and even into the month of May, we saw unprecedented amount of people being impacted and dislocated from their employment. And so, you know, we went from a system that was handling about 2,000 unemployment insurance claims a week to in the thousands, uh, uh, tens of thousands. And so, you know, good news for Colorado is we have seen a decline in new applications for unemployment as we move through May. We anticipate as Colorado goes through uh, a now safer at home order and more businesses are opening and the public is feeling a little bit more comfortable and safe returning to their normal, that more people will be called back to work and our unemployment rolls will continue to go down. Um, I don't think they'll go down as drastically as they went up, but what we do see um, week over week, lower claims and lower long-term claims. I think uh, we need to be prepared to look at as the economy thrives, we'll see more and more people go back to work. I think what people consider work and where they work will look different from now and in the future. People may not be coming into office buildings as they were in the past and have accommodated teleworking or work from anywhere and, and be successful in their roles where they're hired. I think we need to make sure that those people who uh, are gonna be severely impacted long-term, that they have opportunities to look at upskilling and retraining so that they can enter fields where we know that there's gonna be growth because of how the world or the new normal looks like. Um, in Colorado, we talk about resourcing and how we from the Department of Labor worked with the, the surge uh, when no way were resourced or had the capacity to deal with over a half a million people that had impacted work scenarios. And so in Colorado, the governor, Governor Polis was very active on looking, what does the ecosystem look like and how can we make sure that we have people that outside government funded programs can help us as we go through this change and people are gonna start going back to work. And so, you know, in Colorado, we were lucky to be one of the first states with Onward Colorado, a partnership with Bitwise that really created opportunities not only for critical needs, uh, healthcare safety resources, but also job uh, uh, attachment and even training opportunities to help the ecosystem deal with that surge. So I think, you know, we will come out of this. We already seen some occupations that um, are, are starting to hire. Uh, we're looking uh, to work with our employers and our chamber of commerce to make sure that we can put talent in front of them uh, as people start feeling safe to return to work. Trey, let me go to you. Uh, Trey, you are in Logan County. How are you seeing these changes play out in your rural community? And we're seeing a lot of the same things, Dominic. Um, you know, one thing that is fairly fortunate for us out here in, in rural Colorado is uh, a large percentage of our employment base is considered essential. Um, so while we've seen um, a large number of, of unemployment increases, um, 
the, the vast majority of our employment base has been stable. Uh, so that's been a good thing for us out here. Um, you know, we're also experiencing a lot of, of similar changes in, in the workplace and what that looks like in terms of um, where employers are and able to go to remote, remote situations they have. Um, and I think that's something that as we continue to get through this pandemic, it'll lead to some different opportunities for us in, in our area. Um, there's some some different aspects uh, with the remote work piece that in Logan County, we've been positioning ourselves uh, to promote and pursue remote work as an economic development strategy for a few years now. So I actually feel fairly fortunate for our community in uh, how we've been pushing for partnerships with different entities to help our community to find those remote work opportunities and also create infrastructure that will help them to uh, stay stable in those positions. We've got a co-working facility that we have created in the community to assist with broadband needs, for example. Um, and granted, that has certainly shifted with the pandemic and, and the uh, social distancing aspects. But I think in long-term recovery, those types of assets are going to be major resources uh, for rural communities like ours. It's nice to see that those are, are going well. It's uh, uh, especially uh, in a, a tight urban community, sometimes we forget about all the different folks that are still experiencing this in the, in the rural areas. Uh, next, I want to go to Chris, uh, Missy, and Navneet. You are all recent graduates, so first of all, congratulations. Uh, but uh, as part of your gift for your graduation, uh, you now are part of this job market. Uh, what are you experiencing? Chris, let's start with you. As a recent graduate in this job market, what are you experiencing? Sure, thanks, great question. Um, I graduated in December with my Master's of Health Administration from MSU Denver, and so I started looking for jobs in January and February, and um, there were a lot of jobs in healthcare at that time, and I was looking for the right fit for myself. Um, at the end of February, I was offered a contract position with Changing the Narrative, so I've been doing that work since March, which I'm very thankful for. Um, but a lot of my peers and classmates from the MHA program have been looking for work and are struggling and they've been seeing less jobs being posted and it's been a frustration for them and a big concern and so that's a little daunting for a new graduate, especially with a master's degree. Um, but some we've talked a lot about that and we're hopeful that as things um, become less stressful with COVID, Maybe eventually or soon this summer, there will be a lot more jobs showing up, especially in healthcare, and maybe they'll have many offers to choose from. So time will tell, but it's been tough for a lot of students. So I'd be curious to hear what Navneet and um, Missy. Missy have to say, yeah. Chris, that's a great point. Well, let's get to Missy first. Missy, uh, you're again a recent graduate. What are you experiencing uh, entering this job market that is really like none other in recent history? Yeah, it's definitely turned everything upside down for me. I, I as well graduated in December uh, from the University of Colorado Anschutz um, with my doctorate in physical therapy. And I actually began working um, per diem at an outpatient clinic at the beginning of February because I had to take my boards at the end of January. And there's some turnaround time with that. So I had to wait um, to get fully licensed. But that's when COVID kind of started to take off here in the U.S. And the outpatient clinic started to cut hours for all of the um, per diem therapists, the therapists that were kind of just helping out um, and then they started to cut full-time therapists as well. So I was applying for more part-time and full-time jobs wherever I could find them. Um, and I was asked for more um, application materials and interviews. And then early March when things really started to shut down around here, all of those jobs got either delayed or canceled. I have an inbox full of, <laughs> of emails from, um, from employers saying we're gonna delay this or this position has been canceled because they started to hire a lot internally. A lot of the outpatient clinics that were connected with hospitals um, were shutting down due to risk of not knowing 
um, where the patients were coming from, what they had been exposed to, and so they started hiring more internally. So it's been really difficult to get my foot in the door um, as a new graduate. Um, I've seen a lot more jobs pop up in the home health arena, um, going to, into people's homes, but as a new grad, um, they've cautioned us a lot to have our first job be in home health because you're kind of on an island. Uh, you have no mentorship, you're all alone, you don't have many people to network with coworkers or other providers. Um, so I'm hopeful though that there's going to be some more jobs opening up. Essential, um, non-essential surgeries actually have been starting to open up more, which um, is a huge market for physical therapy. And there have been some pop-up clinics that are COVID specific as well, um, helping with pulmon like pulmonary and neurological complications that happen from COVID. So I'm hopeful that it's going to start turning around um, like, like everyone was saying. So I'm hopeful. Well, I certainly share those, the, the same hopeful attitude. I think it's a great way to look at it. Now, Avneet, let's look to you. You have a master's in health administration. Uh, clearly, there's a lot of folks out there, a lot of companies out there that would need help in that area because there's only more people uh, that need uh, health care, but a lot of uncertainty there. What are you experiencing in the job market as a recent graduate? You know what? I totally agree with uh, Missy and Chris because the times are very tough right now and we're facing a lot of challenges during these tough times. Um, I also graduated with Chris in December 2019 in healthcare administration from MSU. And, you know, it's been a really difficult for me to find a job and to find the correct position where I want to work for the rest of my life, you know. Um, and then there are like, you know, the companies aren't hiring, but they, if, even if they are hiring, they want someone with a great experience. So for someone who has recently graduated in the field in which they want to pursue their career are in very indocile situation. And also a lot of classmates that I had my degree with were full-time students. So I cannot even imagine what they're going through because they do not have any kind of financial resource right now and they do not have any jobs. And you know, the most important thing is that we all have to pay the student loans, which is gonna be an unmanageable situation for the most of us. So I think it is very important that we get out of this and like, you know, find the job that we really want, but none of us saw this coming and it's very unstoppable condition that we are in right now. But I think we'll come out of this stronger and we'll face this with much, you know, courage. I uh, certainly agree. Courage is what it's going to take on so many different fronts. Uh, let's get to some of the folks who could uh, uh, give us some advice here. Andrew and Renice, uh, you both work in what, uh, in this industry of how jobs are coming back in and out of the Colorado market. Uh, Andrew, I'm going to start with you. Are there some industries or sectors that are more insulated from the efforts, from the effects of the pandemic? Um, what are you seeing, Andrew? We'll start with you. Sure. It's a terrific question, Dominic. And myself, in my business, just like uh, was mentioned earlier, it has taken this really, really uh, sharp um, decline because, you know, we were talking about Colorado being one of the top employers in the nation at almost what would be defined as full employment to these low unemployment rates from people being laid off or furloughed. Um, the good news, and I am hopeful and optimistic, is that I am starting to see a lot more jobs being posted over the past couple of weeks. And it's different companies, it's different industries. Uh, people are starting to reignite, and they're also trying to starting to realign in terms of how they go about doing their business. So I'm seeing uh, companies that are hiring in strategic thought, in marketing and communications, in terms of how they communicate not only with their clients, but also with their employees themselves. I've had some very interesting jobs relating to workplace environment um, in looking for experts that are helping companies to solve problems and issues that they will be dealing with when they do reopen the doors. So there's um, a lot of opportunity out there. And I think the advice I'm giving to job seekers is to start thinking about how you can help companies solve these issues, these post COVID issues that they're all going to be dealing with. I think the other industry that's going to, uh, we're seeing hurt probably more so is the nonprofit world. Um, the nonprofits that, you know, they uh, operate on a shoestring to begin with, and they're now having to deal with, you know, uh, dried up donations and companies that 
were supporting them in the past that are pulling their support. And I think that's going to be an issue that we're going to be dealing with over the next uh, year or so. But we have done this before. The Great Recession, we saw a lot of the same issues going on. Um, obviously, unique issues now, but there's great resilience. And I think companies are eager to go back and start selling and start making money and operating in, uh, in ways that they can be successful. That's really great points, Andrew. Uh, Renise, let's go to you. You are a senior consultant with the Colorado Workforce Development Council. Uh, what are you seeing and what are some of the trends that uh, we can recognize so far that might give us a little hope as we're looking ahead? Thanks, Dominic. Uh, at the state level, we would echo a lot of what Andrew is seeing. Um, between January and April, we actually saw a 23% decrease in job posting data across the state. However, there are a number of industries that continue to hire. So large number of postings and in industries that you might expect. So occupations like registered nurses or truck drivers. We also are seeing a large number of postings for software developers, administrative support services. So jobs that include waste management or remediation, but also employment services, as well as professional and scientific services um, like accounting or consulting and lawyers. One of the industries that we know was particularly hard hit were our service workers. Uh, folks who are working in retail, hospitality, tourism and leisure across the state were some of the hardest hit uh, by the impacts of COVID-19. And also some of the industries that were not at the forefront for some of the federal relief. So accommodation and food services account for two out of three jobs that were lost, but federal um, assistance really only impacted about 9%. Uh, only 9% of those dollars were going towards that industry, while those workers, many are making on average about $38,000 a year. Um, there is hope, however, there were a number of initiatives that were began before COVID-19. Our office is working closely with local communities on an initiative called Lives Empowered. It's working with industries and frontline workers in retail, hospitality and food and accommodations to really think about how we work with those workers uh, who so many people get their first job in those industries or have been working in those industries, but because of life, because of juggling family and other responsibilities, it's really hard to move up into other jobs. And so seeing some excited and exciting innovations happening across the state to really invest in those frontline workers and provide them with the necessary supports, short-term training opportunities, and wraparound services to really advance. Uh, in Colorado, we actually were the first state agency to receive a $4.1 million grant in 2018 from the Walmart Foundation to invest in that work and to really determine how we meet people where they're at and help them to move up, uh, even in this economy. That certainly makes sense, and it's great to know those resources are out there. Let's get into a different topic. This is a great intergenerational conversation. So let's talk about some of those issues. Even before the pandemic, we were seeing ageism in the workplace with studies showing that older people were more likely to be pushed out or laid off. Karen, let's start with you on this one. Can you tell us a little bit about that and what the Age-Friendly Workplace Initiative has been doing to address that? The Age-Friendly Workplace Initiative is really a part of the Changing the Narrative campaign, which is focusing on basically increasing the dialogue around ageism and evolving, kind of shifting how Coloradans think about ageism. Uh, here in Colorado, what we've really done in, is create this campaign focused on the mature worker and intergenerational workplaces. What we learned, and it's surprising to me here today, the challenges people are facing with finding work, what we learned in 2018, when we went around the state of Colorado, talking about ageism, after every one of our presentations, nearly four dozen, we had people coming up to us, age 40, 50, 60, 70, 80, and beyond, saying, I'm interested in getting back into the workplace, and I'm being challenged. Whether it was somebody who took some time out to care for children, somebody who got laid off, somebody who retired from a position at 74 and wanted to shift into the nonprofit sector, they were saying in 2018, when the market was good, that they were having a difficult time getting back in. So what we started to do was think, well, this is really an issue in the workplace. And we actually did some research to look at what are the challenges to bringing people back into the workplace if they are mature. Turns out there are a lot of stereotypes and myths that kind of evolve around a mature worker. And so the research that we did actually shows, proves that those things are not valid um, problems or issues. So we've created a PowerPoint and a variety of materials that we actually take into chambers of commerce. 
Uh, we've taken them into civic organizations. We've actually had the opportunity to go into workforce development centers and do these presentations and have a dialogue with people. This occurred really predominantly in 2019 and into early 2020, and we were getting extremely good reception because employers were so interested in adding to the workplace. Uh, I think that things will be a little bit different at this point in time. We also had the opportunity to not only present to the employers and those, those bodies, but we did connect with older workers at workforce centers, actually kind of giving them the picture of what is ageism, what are the concerns and stereotypes, and then better equipping them to, in an interview, really talk about the concerns and issues and address those things without a person, the employer saying, having to say, oh gosh, you know, in the back of their mind, this isn't the kind of person I want to hire because of what I think this stereotype or myth is. Uh, the other thing that we you, you talk a little bit about, there are some studies that are out there that actually look at decades of work. The Urban Institute did more than 20 years of research looking at what happened to people after 50 years of age. And what they found is that more than half, more than half of the population were forced out or had to leave involuntarily from their work. So we know ageism has existed over the decades and even in 2018. You know, I think this is really an interesting conversation to have really as a cross-generational conversation like we're doing right now, because we've already talked to recent graduates facing issues, uh, face, well, you don't have enough experience. We're facing uh, uh, older uh, people looking to stay in the workplace, also facing problems. It's, it's really interesting to see the, the commonalities and the struggles. Uh, Tony, let's get to you. Can you tell us a bit about what the Strategic Action Planning Group on Aging has been recommending to reduce workplace discrimination? Thanks for the question, Dominic. Um, sure, the, the Workforce Committee of, of SAPCA encourages uh, the state to collaborate with business chambers, private sectors, and agencies to hire and train older adults in collaboration um, with workforce development centers. So, uh, you know, similar, uh, Karen also serves uh, on this committee and um, it, similar type of parallel efforts going on, but really looking at, at what the state can do in its own workforce practices uh, to highlight the value of older workers and, and the benefits in hiring them. Um, last fall, Prudential, um, company did a lot of uh, research on, on the future of work and did a pulse survey. And in that, they looked at some of the soft skills that many older adults possess and are highly valued in a workplace. And those include strategic thinking, written and verbal communication skills, adaptability, um, and, and also stability and re resiliency. But I think in this time, in, in sort of this uh, pandemic period, some lived experiences, having gone through multiple recessions, 9-11, and, uh, and other things that really older workers can help share across generations of people who may be facing uh, a crisis for the first time in, in their work life. Um, I think the state can also encourage uh, employers to include age in their diversity, equity, and inclusion. Uh, policies and statements, as well as their practices. Many companies also have uh, employee resource groups, and we can encourage them to have intergener intergenerational workforce groups uh, as well. And then finally, I think um, encouraging companies to actually put metrics uh, to uh, accountability metrics of how they're reaching their business goals. So for example, if you have an aging customer base, then it would make sense that you're hiring older workers to help uh, serve some of that those customers and I think United Health is an example where they actually tied some metrics of uh, who they're serving uh, with who they're hiring so those are some of the things that we're looking at and, and going forward looking to, to recommend to the state well thank you very much for that Chris I want to get to you uh, you are indeed someone uh, that some that might call you a non-traditional student uh, getting your master's degree at an older age. How do you think uh, this situation might affect your job hunting prospects uh, in a positive or negative way? Good question. Thanks for asking that. Um, yes, I'm a non-traditional student. I earned my bachelor's degree while I was in my 40s and I just graduated last year at age 54 with my MHA. And um, I'm keenly aware of ageism because of the work that I'm doing at Changing the Narrative, so that's helpful for me being older. 
Um, but it's also something that I think is interesting for me, having gone to school with so many people that are younger than myself, and then seeing that they're also facing issues with employment and job searching. Um, but in my situation, I think that my age and my education and experiences um, through living this longer life so far um, are assets. And as an example, I was accepted as a board member for Colorado Senior Lobby. And I'm also a volunteer with AARP hosting monthly webinars. And just both of those opportunities may not have come about if I were several decades younger than I am. Um, so I think age is a benefit in those circumstances. And also the work that I'm doing with changing the narrative, I've been able to host many um, intergenerational conversations about ageism. And a couple of weeks ago, I hosted a, a session and there was a woman that attended who was 70 years old and a nurse. And she recently had applied for a job. Actually, it was five months ago that she had applied for a job as a nurse at a hospital in Colorado. And she was concerned that her age would be a barrier to getting that job. But it turns out she went through the process and they didn't ask her any questions about her age. And she was relieved. She got the job and was really happy there. And age never came into play like while she was working but then about two months into the job um, a new supervisor was hired who was in her 30s who made an ageist comment to this woman who was 70 and it really took her by surprise and um, just she didn't expect that to happen because everything had been going so well and this uh, created an opportunity for the two of them to start having conversations, which they did, and talking about age and just sharing their experiences about being older and being younger and being judged based upon the age that they were. So she thought it was a really eye-opening situation for both of them. Um, but me, for me personally, I'm an advocate for all generations and um, the work that I'm doing has been really enlightening and what I'm seeing with the generations coming together is that people do want to understand each other and they really want to learn from each other. And um, research has actually shown that ageist views are reduced through intergenerational conversations and connections with education included in those conversations. And the misconceptions of aging are then reduced because people are just finding out that they have much more in common and being lumped together and judged just based upon a generation is incorrect. So it's helpful to have conversations and start talking to people of other generations so you can realize you do have things in common. Well, certainly as a conversation moderator, I'm always a big fan of conversations, but I really like the perspective you bring up and the, the, in the conversation between two people uh, that really brought out some similarities and some, found some progress. Trey, let me go to you. You have taken a really bold position in Logan County, touting older workers as an asset and a resource to employers. Tell us more about how that's going on. You know, so that conversation really started, oh gosh, going back almost two years ago now. And part of that really relates to our smaller labor pool that we have in rural Colorado. And we have employers that were struggling to fill certain positions. And some of those positions were pretty decent paying jobs. They were maybe more skilled positions that um, we don't have, I guess, real depth in those ranks uh, is one way to put it. And so we started having conversations about could the retiree and older adult community be an option um, to help educate those employers as uh, looking to that demographic as, as a resource for them. Um, and, and part of that was coming through some anecdotal conversations and, and reports that we were seeing through the community of seeing more of, of the older adults and retirees that were relocating to uh, northeastern rural Colorado. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of reasons that our communities fit well with where they're at in life. Um, and so we were seeing them choosing to move out this direction. Um, and there was a, a disconnect between uh, some of them that were seeking other job opportunities and, and the ability to continue doing some level of work and, and our employers that were struggling to fill those positions. Um, so we put a, a collaborative effort together of multiple agencies um, working to make some of those connections. Um, and, you know, just to give you one example, we have a manufacturer that was struggling to find an inventory and purchasing specialist. 
And so we discussed the possibility of whether or not they would consider uh, working with retirees in those positions and, and consider a job sharing component. Um, and the comment that they made was, well, if I can't find one full-time position, how am I going to fill two part-time positions? Um, so we, we worked with them to create kind of a network to where we were doing community outreach and encouraging the retirees and older adults to um, connect through the Workforce Center um, here in Sterling as well as through the Chamber of Commerce so we could begin developing somewhat of a, a database, for lack of a better term, um, to help make those connections for people that have those skill sets. Um, you know, as we look at, at that retiree and, and older adult group, um, the fact that they're bringing, you know, often decades of experience and, and um, a wide variety of experience and skill sets, um, they're a major resource uh, for our, our rural communities. Um, you know, so that's, that's definitely something that we, we were working to pursue. Um, you know, additionally, as, as we've continued down that path, we have talked about other ways that we see value with the older adult community and how we want to um, better embrace them and, and even position our community as a place that um, is good for them to maybe relocate to as, as they make the decision that um, they no longer need or, or want to be in such an urban setting, um, which you know certainly connects with everything going on COVID. But um, we want to create an environment that's that's very friendly and encouraging for that um, that movement as well. And you know, part of that was also looking back to the remote work component. Um, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we've been pursuing remote work as a general economic development strategy for a few years now. Um, but specifically in the retiree community, we see that as, as being a major resource. Um, as economic development, that is a way for us to bring in jobs that we don't physically have in this community. It's a way for them to bring that income in, um, and that becomes uh, primary employment in, in our communities. Um, and for the retiree, the concept is to have a remote work uh, position and, and encouraging that activity to where it enables them to maintain a certain level of flexibility, whether whether they're um, you know post retirement looking for that that um, next career move or or something that they want to continue to be engaged with. Maybe it's additional income, whatever the case may be, but still offering some flexibility that goes along with that, um, both of where they can work as well as when they can work. Um, and so we're actually working through some new initiatives right now to. Uh, to create some additional partnerships and push for um, a specific retiree and older adult remote working program um, to where we can help assist them in, in landing those positions um, and then connect that back in through our community co-working facility um, because, you know, as I think we all, all realize that connectivity uh, is so important in that socialization piece. And so we want to make sure that there's a conduit for that. Um, and then it also connects in with the cross-generational component. You know, part of the vision with our co-working facility is that it um, is there to, to assist with entrepreneurs and, and some of our, our younger business members that are either doing freelance work and, and those marketing components and, and some of those others, um, like Andrew mentioned, that, that they're seeing postings for. Um, but then also to be able to connect intergenerationally with the older adults um, for some of those soft skills, like Tony mentioned, um, you know, that community, the older adults, um, they understand that work ethic piece. And that's one of the biggest challenges that we're seeing with our employers in, in the workforce today. Um, so, you know, I think it, it's something that could create some really good cross pollination opportunities where, you know, they can assist each other, whether that be the technology components, um, assisting the older adults with, uh, remote work positions and, you know, some of that, that work ethic and, and some of that education for, uh, our younger entrepreneurs. Um, so I think there's, there's a lot of good back and forth there. Um, you know, one other key piece that we're seeing, especially with the remote work right now, kind of goes back to the COVID situation and some of the layoffs and things that we are seeing and, and those concerns with the older adults in the workplace and the susceptibility to contracting and, and being more vulnerable to, um, to COVID. And so pushing for more remote work opportunities um, I think is valuable to that community as well because it allows them to get past that that concern of some of the employers of um, you know those risks that may be associated with that community. 
That's a lot of great input. It's amazing how fast this conversation is going. So I'm going to uh, keep us rolling and uh, ask for some quicker takes on this. Andrew, I want to go to you, but what something that Trey brought up, uh, the ageism in the workplace, but also specifically to the COVID situation, because now we're dealing with a whole lot of other factors. Tell us more about what you're seeing specifically dealing with this pandemic. Well, sure. The job seekers I work with, particularly older job seekers, and I'm not talking I'm talking job seekers over their 50s. They have a unique set of obstacles to begin with that was um, brought up by Karen. And I see it in job postings in terms of language, in terms of people that are saying they want digital natives and these little Q, Q words that is, they're clearly looking for somebody who is younger. Now, with COVID, uh, a report was just released last week by the Colorado Department of Health, and it was actually a modeling report that is showing and recommending that people over the age of 60 uh, still remain at home because they are more susceptible to COVID. Well, that right there is going to give more ammunition to employers who are saying, you know, we don't want the liability. We don't want to have older folks here who might spread it more. I mean, a, a whole host of things that they could justify as to not um, uh, even considering older job seekers in these positions. And I think we need to really strike a fine balance. And I, I did like uh, hearing more about, you know, the idea of working from home and the idea of being able to work remotely. There's a ton of experience, a ton of maturity, a ton of strength that um, older, mature job seekers are bringing to the table that are going to be extremely valuable in helping us get back to a new normal in dealing with a lot of these issues, workplace issues that we're um, uh, dealing with. So I think we need to be very careful though in re reaching that balance in terms of how we treat older job seekers right now, particularly as it relates to COVID. Andrew, I think you make a great point. I think this is a great opportunity to really talk about the future of work. Uh, in fact, many people are saying that some of the changes we've experienced during the pandemic are gonna fundamentally change work things like working remotely, things like that. Catherine, we haven't had a chance to come to you. Let me ask you, you head up the Col uh, Colorado's Office of the Future of Work, just the perfectly aptly titled uh, department in this era. Uh, and uh, your, that office is looking at issues uh, even well before the pandemic. Tell us about some of the big trends that you've seen and that you see coming. Yeah, thanks for the question, Dominic, and for having me here. Uh, prior to the pandemic, when the office was established in September of last year, in a lot of the conversations I had, I would talk about how the future of work is now. And I think that became even more true as we saw the onset of COVID-19. Um, before I talk about the trends, I do want to just clarify how we see the future of work and define that at the Department of Labor and Employment. Because I think with a, a term like the future of work being so broad, it means many different things to different people. So when we're, we're talking about it, we're really referring to the impact of a, a variety of forces from globalization and market shifts to the demographic shifts in our state as well as the technological advances and so each of those plays a role in transforming the type of work we do and how we do it across the state and so my office was um, tasked with researching and understanding what that looks like across colorado raising awareness and identifying solutions promising practices to create a skilled and resilient workforce. And what we've seen across the board so far with the pandemic is the acceleration of many of these trends that we were already looking at. When it comes to globalization, while we've experienced years and years of sort of increased global connectedness, we were actually seeing some, some decline in that. And now, of course, with the pandemic making people question these really long supply chains and um, these systems that have a lot of uh, inefficiencies or risk when it comes to a global pandemic and what that might mean for onshoring and supply chain integration to create opportunities in Colorado. We've talked a lot about the demographic uh, demographics in Colorado. Um, we know as a state that we are, you know, sort of rapidly aging and at the same time our younger generations are much more diverse than the generations that came before it. And we know that many of the low wage jobs that Renice mentioned that were the first impacted by the pandemic are held by a lot of those younger, more diverse populations that haven't always been served by the system. And then on the other end, we have older workers who are experiencing discrimination prior to the pandemic. And a lot of the interventions that we were looking at sort of depended on this really tight labor market where employers 
we're looking to diversify their talents. And so as we see, you know, retirement um, savings and challenges for our experienced workers, that, that brings a whole host of, of changes and challenges as we try to help them recover and not experience a slower recovery than other parts of our population. Some of the other trends I think probably most common when people hear future of work, they think of artificial intelligence, automation, and the digitalization of work. And so with that comes the, the need for digital literacy and digital connection across the state. Uh, and we're seeing that now more than ever that there are pockets of our communities that don't have access to technology or internet connection and the impact that has on their ability to connect and take advantage of remote work opportunities in this sort of digital workplace. So um, as the pandemic continues to evolve and as work continues to evolve, there's a real need to focus on those skills and that technology so that people will work alongside technology as um, work changes. Um, some of the predictions in the past have been about, you know, displacement of jobs due to automation uh, and artificial intelligence. And so we are seeing that in some industries, there's a, more of an accelerated consideration for adoption of that technology than prior to the pandemic, both for safety reasons um, and also for the, the challenge in hiring um, as we, we move out of the, the pandemic. And then finally, I think the um, pandemic has really shown a light as well on the, the independent contractor workforce or the gig workforce um, that have been sort of on the front lines delivering all of our, our meals and groceries and other goods to us throughout the pandemic. Um, we've also seen them have access to unemployment assistance through um, the, the CARES Act for the first time. And so as that workforce continues to grow and be a larger part of our, our workforce uh, for all ages, we really need to take a look at, at what that, those benefits look like and how to increase worker safety and protections for, for workers across, across ages and industries and types of work that they're doing. So I think those are some of the, the trends in a nutshell. And these are the same trends we were, were looking at prior to the pandemic, um, but it's really, really been um, highlighted and accelerated in a lot of ways. So the future of work is now, um, and it makes future of work sort of a misnomer because we really need to address some of these challenges now. I totally agree, and I know I can probably speak for a lot of the gig workers that work with PBS 12 and a lot of other uh, media entities around the community, uh, talking to them, talking about them, the struggles they're facing. It's a very good point. Uh, Tony, let me get to you for your uh, quick take on this one. On a national level, what is research showing about the future of workplaces? What's your quick take? Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, I, I'm actually a gig worker with the conference board, and, and they do a lot of research around um, workforce. And so one of the areas that they issued a report last year is called Growing the American Workforce. And what they have um, found is that um, support, supporting older workers who wish to remain in working, that there um, are four points. One, funding public information campaigns to counter employer misperceptions. Two, eliminating insurance cost disparities that may motivate discrimination through market-based health reform. Three, piloting repeal of the Social Security Retirement Earnings Test and for piloting initiatives support flexible work arrangements, uh, including by increasing access to non-wage benefits and worker protections, typically only available to full-time workers. So kind of building on what, what Catherine uh, was saying uh, as well. Um, so I think that those, um, you know, looking at our demographics and, and the longevity of the people are living longer, yet we have falling birth rates. I think once we get past this current crisis and even look five to 10 years out, we're going to need more people in the workforce. And one of the solutions that the conference board uh, is putting forward is that you can help solve those gaps by really strengthening uh, the older adults in the workforce. I tell you what, I told you before how fast uh, an hour can go with this group, and we have such a great, diverse panel of experts. What I want to do is get everyone's take on this question, and um, as we're looking to rebuild the economy post-pandemic, what will be most important? What should we be looking for? I'm going to go through our entire panel and ask you to spend about, uh, about 45 seconds just telling us what you feel is the most important thing we should be looking for. Uh, I want to start with where we started. Uh, Joe Barella, let me start with you and your take on what is the most important look as we look towards the future. 
I think we need to make sure that the economy is in a position where people feel safe to go out and continue to operate and function pre-pandemic. I think as more and more businesses can accommodate how we have to wear face coverings or worry about hygiene to prevent the spread of the virus or keep it at a, a, a level that is tolerated by our healthcare system, people need to start thinking, you know, is 50% to 60% of normal, 70% of normal, and what that does as people have the opportunity to get engaged in a work situation. I do think like most people, um, we will probably see a many, many of our occupations that used to travel into offices, figure out that they could be more productive and enjoy working uh, anywhere and not in an office building. That could be from a co-working uh, station in, in their community, um, from their home, uh, from a workforce center, from a library. So I think that's going to take some time, but we're going to find out that we can probably look at efficiencies from our workforce. We're also going to have to figure out what about those positions uh, that will never come back in the hospitality, the tourism, the lodging sector, or will take many, many months to come back. And what can we do with those individuals to either uh, keep them uh, financially secure in their homes to be the unemployment system, or can we look at upskilling or training opportunities that we can move them into other sectors that are growing so that there's a skills and a competency match? Uh, we need to make sure that our employers that are struggling for critical talent, that they're looking at how they're hiring. Is there um, uh, proxies that they put in place, such as uh, an advanced degree or four-year degree or even years of experience that maybe aren't what they should be looking for? Maybe we have to make sure they're looking at the skills and competencies, and then we make sure that our training programs or education systems are putting those people into the system with those skills and competencies and people are aware of those and so that they, they can make good decisions about what their future careers look like. I do think we need to be optimistic. I do think we need to be patient, but I do think we have, you know, I, I heard an economist uh, that used to be in the Obama administration say that, you know, this is more like a, uh, a, nat a natural disaster and not an economic downturn. Uh, we will probably go through a, a very rapid couple of months, three months, where there's a dramatic dive in, in economic activity, uh, job impact, but we'll come out of it very quickly. I'm hoping he's correct uh, that we'll see the economy start calling these impacted workers back to their previous employment or new opportunities as we move forward. Bernice, let me go to you next. I want to get your take on uh, what employers will be looking for. What's the most important thing we need to be looking towards ahead in this post-pandemic economy? Bernice, what do you think? Thanks, Dominic. Uh, in Colorado, we have such a diverse body of business businesses across our state, so large employers, small employers. Uh, and as in any crisis, we all have decisions about how we will respond to that crisis that we have to make. And so while there's no consistent thing that every employer is looking for, uh, what we hear consistently through all our employers is that they're looking for people who can adapt, who have a strong work ethic, and who can add value. We're also hearing that it's really important that we don't just look at this as business as usual. As we seek to reopen, it's really critical that we find new ways to innovate and really address some of the systemic issues that we heard before around inequity, ageism, low wages, and really take a, a deeper look at job quality and how we not just provide any job, but really provide jobs that are helping all of our people to move ahead. Karen, let's go to you next. Give us your quick take on really what we need to be thinking about as we move towards the future. So looking towards the future, one of the things that I think is most important is that we think intergenerational. Today, we have five generations in the workplace. I expect that that will continue for decades. And we have to be thinking about things from that perspective. Um, so when we think about the talent pipeline, we're thinking about high school to 85 plus. We have more than 250,000 people, 85 and over, working. So I think that's one thing that we really need to be looking at and, and really focus too on flexibility, whether it's flex time, flex schedule, flex location, flex assignment, flex project. Um, I think that that appeals to all generations and are things that we, we really need to take a look at. And, and we'll do our part to educate about ageism so that people are understanding that, that issue. That's a key element of it. Navneet, let me go to you, our recent graduate. Give us your quick take on what you think as we're, we should be focusing on what's most important as we head towards the future. I think safety and environment are the two evident components everyone is going to want after this pandemic is over. And safety and cleanliness are going to be the two crucial things that the job hunters are going to want. 
because it is very significant for them uh, after this pandemic is over because they want on hands training and I don't see that most of the companies are going to be working remotely once this is over, especially the healthcare industry. So I believe that everybody needs to experience the workplace uh, with working remotely. Um, and I think once this is over, everyone can resume normal activities as they were before and we'll all will come out stronger from this. And I hope everybody's healthy. Well, Tony, I'd like to go to you next. What is your uh, quick take as we're, we're getting towards the end of the show? Most important thing is we're looking towards the post-epidemic economy. Thanks, Dominic. And I'll just build on what Karen said, and, and that really is the intergenerational workforce. And, um, you know, I think uh, we can determine the future we want. And, and we can start building that right now. And uh, I think we're taking steps to do that. And um, that it, it, we will be stronger uh, by having uh, a better and um, you know, active intergenerational workforce. Andrew, of course, uh, with your jobs list, uh, you're, you're on the front lines of what we're looking towards the future. Tell us what you feel is most important as we're looking ahead post-COVID? Well, I'm actually extremely hopeful based on our, our country's historic resilience. Um, this is a comma. It's not a period. Um, what our economy is going through right now is a deep breath, not a suffocation. And if you look back in history at the challenges that this country has gone through before and how we have come out even better um, based on our hope and our resilience and our determination, I think we're going to see the same thing here. I'm seeing a lot of employees right now, a lot of uh, job seekers who are realigning their careers, reinventing themselves. Um, you know, they may have been married to their jobs in the past, but this stay at home time off has given them an opportunity to do some serious introspection and in figuring out what they really want to do in the future. That's a great point as always. Just so wonderful comments from really everyone in our panel. Uh, Joe, I want to go to you about uh, giving us an optimistic last word. There is a whole lot of, um, I think, fear and uh, just wondering what's going on, uncertainty, if you will. Uh, with your uh, perspective, give us a, a word of optimism and what we can be looking forward to as we look ahead. You know, I think we've all said the new normal is going to require um, accountability on all parts, accountability from the government, accountability from private and public sector employment, but accountability on workers to make sure we get this right. I think we need to make sure that when we create a safe environment, we have workers being able to work at their most product product self. We also have consumers coming out and working. And so I do think that, you know, as we continue to have more and more people have the opportunity to go back to their previous employer because it was a temporary furlough or a temporary layoff, we will still have opportunities to work with people who will never be called back to their previous employment. And we need to make sure, regardless of their age, that they have access to that through either upskilling or labor exchange that gets them redirected where we see growth. So I do think that as we work through that, we have to give people time to figure that out, get comfortable with how their life was upended. Um, we have some safety nets that are in place that give people the opportunity to, if, if they're, they're not, it's not the right time for them to go back to work because of unavailability of childcare, or maybe um, a, a person in their home needs them to deal with a, the COVID crisis, they can take advantage of unemployment insurance during this time uh, and still feel financially secure. So I think we need to be patient and everyone's individual situation is different. But as people are ready and able to go back to work, we want them to have opportunities so that they can be successful. From our new graduates who are on the panel today, I do think there will be a rebound in the healthcare industry uh, as we have more and more elective procedures happening and more and more dentist uh, vision centers opening up. There'll be opportunities and we'll need a, a talented and skilled workforce to do that. So um, be hopeful, as Andrew said, and I, I'm very optimistic that um, we can figure this out in Colorado. Uh, Joe, thank you. And I, I share your optimism, the optimism also of Andrew. And really, I, I first want to say uh, how much I want to thank all of you joining us on this panel today for On the Same Page. It, uh, it's easy to take for granted the value of conversation and 
when you get a panel like this, I think you see really the cross-generational, the multi-generational perspectives that are so valuable, but there's so much commonality. I think back to some of the comments we've heard today and how different generations speaking to each other, really figuring out the best solution. And I feel if we're facing something like the COVID-19 crisis and really our path forward, the best solution is gonna come from conversations like this. So I really cannot thank this wonderfully diverse and talented panel enough for all of your work and sharing your expertise with all of our audience. If you'd like to watch this show online, please check it out at pbs12.org. And please check out our next discussion next Friday, June 19th at 7 p.m. right here on PBS 12. If uh, you'd like to join the conversation, maybe ask a question yourself with a comment, please feel free to call 303-991-5027, or you can go to changingthenarrativeco.org. Uh, we're just so excited for so many people on our panel contributing, but really everybody at home being a part of this conversation. That's what makes it so vital and why we're here. And I think why we share the optimism of Andrew, Joe, and really everybody in our panel that we will find a way forward. For everyone here on the same page, I'm Dominic Dizzuti. Thank you so much for watching. Good night.